At the King's House, there are six core values that we have as a church. Uh, these six core values are really our heartbeat. They are the, the, the values that steer our decisions. Uh, I always weigh the direction of the church and the decisions of the church. Does it fit inside of these six core values of who we are as the King's House? And as I prayed for this weekend, the Lord really laid one of these core values on my heart, and I just want to share that with you today. I believe that as I do, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is going to awaken this inside of you, because I believe it should be a core value for every born-again believer. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Love Until It Hurts. Love Until It Hurts. I want to share with you a passage out of John chapter 15, verse 12. This is out of the New Living Translation. It says, this is my commandment, love each other. And we can, we can handle that part. I mean, that's what Jesus said. All men are going to know that you're my disciples if you do what? You awake out there, BCC? <laughs> I can't see you at all. I hope your eyes are open. <laughs> all men are going to know you're my disciples if you love one another. So here's Jesus giving this command, love each other. And yeah, God, I can do that. Man, I can shake hands, I can be kind, I can be nice, I can check on ba I can check on people, maybe even do a hospital visit. If somebody misses church for a few Sundays, I'm, I'm going to love them. Yeah, Jesus, I can do that. But the verse goes on, and this is really the sticky part of the verse, in my opinion. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Now, friends, that's where the game changer really comes into play. Because we're not just talking some kind of, of normal, carnal, human kind of love that always has strings attached. we got to love in the same way that he loves us. Whole different ball game here. So the obvious question is, if we're going to be able to accomplish this, then we have to ask ourselves, how does God love us? We can go to one of the most common scriptures in the entire Bible. I'm sure you've all read it. Probably the first verse you ever memorized as a child if you grew up in church. One of the most quoted and well-known verses. But this is where we really kind of see the way that God loves us. It's in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him does not have to perish but can have eternal life. God gave now, this is the kind of love that he loves us with, a love that costs something, a love that is not all about what can I get, but actually to ask the question, what can I, I give instead? You're one and only son. I mean, this is a love that costs, a love that hurts. I can wrap my mind around that part of the verse, but honestly, the part of the verse that stumped me for years and years of my life was the very first part of that verse, for God so loved and I would always ask myself the question, what does so loved mean? I mean, I, I love my wife, I love my mom, I love my, my dad, I love my dogs. I, love, I mean, I know what love is, but what does this so loved mean? If, if this is the way that God loves us, if this is the way that we're supposed to love each other and love the world, God so loved. Well, 13 years ago, I, I, I finally understood what that phrase, so loved, means. Uh, Erica was pregnant. Uh, the day of delivery was upon us. We had no idea if we were having a boy or a girl. I mean, just all this anticipation and, and all this anxiety and fear. And, and if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, there's three kinds of dads on, on delivery day. There's the ones in the, in the waiting room, the ones who were very encouraging up by the mother's head. And then there's option number three, and you're down there getting your hands dirty. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'm option number three. Like, I'm in it to win it, baby. And it's a lot going on down there. It really is. But the moment came, and, and, and the baby's coming out. And I will never forget that moment. The doctor catches the baby. We still don't know what it is. True story. I'm not making this up. The doctor holds up my daughter by one leg and says, hey, it's a girl. Like, dude, keep both hands on that thing, man. It's wet. It's slippery. You can't go to Walmart and just get a different one. Like, I'm going to need you to keep both. So they get her all cleaned up, and, and they put that little girl in my arms. And for the first time in my life, I finally knew what that verse meant God so loved. I didn't know it was humanly possible to feel that kind of love, to feel that kind of affection 
for another human being. And the crazy thing about it was is that this human being had done nothing to deserve that. Think about it. Had done nothing to earn it. It was just a love just because. You're my little girl, period. That's all that matters. I was crazy over the moon in love. So loved this little girl. I'll never forget the first time she scored points in a basketball game. Uh, Melody is terrible at basketball, by the way. She took after her mom in that department. It was the last game of the season. Her team is getting obliterated. They're down by 40 points, literally. It is so hard to watch. They're so terribly coached. I mean, it's just, it's an embarrassment. There's a few minutes left in the game. Uh, a girl shoots a shot. I can't even say that Melody, like, really rebounded it. It just so happened that the ball fell in her hands beneath the bucket. She stands there and looks around for just a second. I scream, shoot! She throws a ball up towards the hoop. It whirls around a few times. It, it, the ball goes through the hoop. And there is this maniac in the stands. This dude jumps up on the bleachers in front of him. At the top of his lungs, as if his soccer team had just won the World Cup, this lunatic screams, Goal! The entire gym gets quiet and stares at this lunatic. It was me, by the way, in case you... I was out of my mind. She fi We're losing by 40 points. It was the first points that she had scored the entire year. They're terrible. It didn't matter in that moment. Are you with me, VCC? I so loved this little girl. It is not based on her performance. It's not based on how good or bad she is. She can't do anything to earn it. She can't do anything to change it. I'm not, yeah, it, this love cost me something, baby. Let me tell you something. It costs something. But I give and I give and I give, and there's no strings attached. I'm not looking to see what I can get from her. I'm looking to see how much of my love and my affection can I show her with no strings attached. She is so loved. And this is the way that God loves you this morning, VCC. Man, I believe that somebody in this room needs to hear that and needs to believe that this morning. No strings attached, no performance required. You are so loved this morning by a God who knew you before you were ever born. You can never change that love, no matter how good or how bad. It doesn't matter. Unconditional love is what he has for each and every one of us this morning. And you have to have that reality if we're going to love this world the way that God's called us to love this world. How many of you believe this morning that God wants to use you to do some incredible things? I'm sorry, you didn't hear the question. I said, how many of you believe that God wants to use you to do some incredible things? Man, I believe that. See, I was a drug baby growing up. Every Sunday and every Wednesday, I was drugged to church. I'm here all day, folks, seriously. <laughs> and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I was drugged to Christian school. And I can probably count on one hand how many times I've, I've missed a Sunday service in my 37 years of being on this planet. It's a wonderful way to grow up, and I'm so blessed. The world's best parents, the world's best grandparents, just surrounded by people that love me and love God and raised me. Uh, so blessed. But along the way, uh, maybe some of you can identify, growing up in church, you can develop some really unhealthy mindsets. And I, and I found myself falling into that mindset. Uh, it seemed to me, uh, it was portrayed to me, that God was upset a lot. And he was upset at me a lot. And it seemed like this guy was, was kind of always in a bad mood, hard to please, most certainly wasn't proud of me. But you start to develop these mindsets that if I do A, B, C, X, Y, Z, then, then God will be proud of me a little bit. Uh, it, uh, he, he won't want to lightning bolt me in that moment. Like we're okay. So mentally, I start developing these checklists. And I'm sure that some of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's the checklist of am I being a good little Christian? Number one, did I pray this morning? Check. 
Did I read my Bible? Well, yesterday, close enough, check. Have I listened to any worship music? Did I, did I, did I worship? Yeah, okay, check. Uh, have I witnessed to somebody? Have I shared the gospel? Like, well, six months ago, close, close enough, check. But we, we go down our little checklist, like, okay, yeah, 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 I'm being good. I'm a good Christian. God loves me. He's proud of me. Everything is in order. And I lived years of my life like that, just going down my little checklist, never really understanding the love of Jesus, never really understanding the relationship that was available to me as his child. This went on for years. I was a youth pastor for years. I've been a worship pastor since I was 16, 21 years. I've been a worship pastor, assistant pastor. I mean, I've served in every way that you can serve in a church. It wasn't until I started working at a hospice as a chaplain that something really began to shift in my life. And this is really the point I want to uh, drive home with you today. I ran into a very serious crisis. Uh, you get a lot of bad news working for hospice, you know. Uh, six months or less to live. And for four years I did this. The situation I run in, ran into is that I began to realize my Christianity is not that effective in the real world. The things I learned in Christian school and the things I learned in Bible school, uh, not saying that they're irrelevant or unimportant, but Meanwhile, out in reality, out in the real world, these are very ineffective. In the gospel of the Christianity that I have, the world needs something so much more than that. I began to realize I was missing something. Now, you might find this hard to believe, but of all the hundreds of people that I was with in their last days and even last moments of life, hundreds, hundreds, literally, do you know not one of those people asked me, what my end time doctrine or theology was? How ridiculous is that? You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. Of all the things you need to be concerned about, that's definitely we need to be concerned about end time rapture and doctrine and, and pre trib, post trib. Not one person asked me that. I spent a lot of time learning about those things in Bible school, but that. Do you know in, in someone's last dying breath, not one person, not one, asked me, Pastor Mark. Do you believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Ugh. Not one person. Some of these things that are so divisive in the church and keep Christians separated, out in reality, in the real worlds, people on their deathbed, kind of irrelevant. But what I also began to realize is that I had access to the most powerful to the most effective, to the most transcendent tool. It is available to me for me to use wherever, whenever, on whoever that I choose to use. This incredible tool, I have access to it. Let me tell you what worked in the real world was this powerful tool called love. I'm telling you, now that did powerful, incredible things. This was an incredible tool. So I started getting rid of my checklist, if you will, and I began to ask myself just one question. Here's the question I began to ask myself every single day. And I want some of you to, to search your heart and say, Holy Spirit, do I need to get rid of my checklist today? Is this the question I need to be asking myself? Because we're called to love like he loves, love until it hurts. The question I started asking was, how am I loving? Plain and simple. Not did I pray, did I read, did I went check, 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 check. How am I loving? If this is how the whole world is supposed to know, then shouldn't I be spending a whole lot more time thinking about it, praying about it, trying to be that? I didn't pray in tongues for an hour today. It's okay. How am I loving? An individual came to Jesus in Luke chapter 10, and he asked Jesus, I, I want eternal life. Tell me, what is the greatest commandment? And in Luke 10, 27, this is how Jesus responded. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law can be summed up in that one statement. Love God with your whole heart, your mind, your soul, everything. He deserves your everything. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. The question you need to ask yourself today, VCC, who is my neighbor? 
Is it just the people that I live next to? Is it the people I work with? Is it the people I go to school with? Is it the people in the... Who are my neighbors? Who is it that I'm supposed to be loving until it hurts? Who does God want to use me to touch or to make a difference in the life of? I'll never forget I was going on a hospice visit uh, just a few miles from a, a big metroplex in Oklahoma called Holdenville. Not a Metroplex. Pastor Jason and, and Miss Lynn know all about this city. They served there for years and years. Little country city, and I was 10 miles outside of this little country city named Holdenville. It was my first visit to this house. A patient's dying of cancer. I'll never forget, I pull up to this house, and all I see are cats. I mean cats. Cats on the roof, cats in the barn, cats on the porch, cats in tree, cats, man. I could smell the cat urine before I ever got out of my car. I'm talking next level filth, trash, and cats. And on the inside, I'm thinking, good grief, God, really? I mean, I'm not up for crazy cat lady today, Lord. I need, and I'll never forget, I. I, I, I'm fighting through the overwhelming ammonia stench of cat urine. And I go up and I knock on the door and knock, knock, knock. Wait there for about two seconds. Oh, dadgum, no one answered. Well, <laughs> I tried. As I'm walking off the porch, I hear the door open. Somebody pokes their face out of the door. They say, Pastor, hold on one second. I'm going to finish my marijuana and I'm going to let you in. I said, Okay. This happens every day. Nope. I go back, sit in my car to avoid the multitude of cats. In a few minutes, I see the door open back up. They wave me in. And I want you to know, I walked into the cloud that morning. It was not the glory cloud. It was not the presence of God. That house was full of marijuana smoke, man. So obviously, I start going, <gasps> how are you guys today? <gasps> This is the best visit ever. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> True story, I, I go up to the lady who's on hospice. I said, hey, my name's Mark. I'm the chaplain. It's, it's great to meet you. Her words are, hey, pastor, my name's Debbie, but you should probably call me Doobie. <laughs> I said, okay, Doobie, Doobie it is. Pleasure meeting you today, Miss Doobie. I visit with Doobie for several minutes. I share the gospel with Doobie. And that day, she gives her heart to Jesus right there in her living room. I come back the next week for my next visit. I find out that she has a husband in the next room who's paralyzed from the waist down. He's been paralyzed for 20 years, motorcycle accident. That room was unbelievable. The filth and the stench. And he looked like he hadn't bathed in 20 years. And his hair was, I mean, it was... Naturally, I didn't really want to go in that room. But as I did, I just felt the tug of God on my heart to share the gospel with this individual. And her husband gave his heart to the Lord that day. And before long, I had led Debbie's sister to the Lord, Debbie's mother to the Lord, Debbie's son to the Lord, Debbie's husband to the Lord to the Lord, and I'll never forget preaching her funeral, standing above her casket. As I looked out over that crowd, every person in that room called me pastor by this point. And all I saw was people who had given their hearts to Jesus, who had been miraculous, ripped out of the, the clinches of hell and are going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. And I couldn't help but just be overwhelmed, church. I was so thankful in that moment that I didn't let cats and cat urine and stench and uncomfortability keep me from doing what God had commissioned me to do that day. I want you to know heaven is a very different place today all because some little redheaded nobody decided I'm going to love when it's uncomfortable to love. I'm going to give find a way to give some more. I'm going to love until it hurts. Church, this is what God's calling us to be. And I want you to know that love until it hurts, it's not always going to be comfortable, and it's not always going to be convenient. And the people that God's calling you to reach might be smelly, and might be weird, and might be scary, and they may be so polar opposite of you, but who's your neighbor? 
And who is God asking you to reach? Who has God chosen that only you can reach? You might be the only Jesus that people at your work, people at your school, people on your ball, you might be the only Jesus that they ever have the opportunity to meet. Jesus goes on with the story in Luke chapter 10. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. I'm sure that, that you've all heard this story before, and, and I, I know what you're saying, like, yeah, that's a good story, Pastor Mark, we get it. Be like the Samaritan, yeah, do, do good things to people, that's what Christians should do. Take that off my checklist. I want to take a moment, just t- take a little bit deeper look and really ask, Jesus, who are these characters in this story? And what is it that you're trying to communicate to me through this incredible parable? Always questions we need to ask reading parables. Who are the characters and what is it that Jesus is trying to communicate to me? The first character in this story is the man who was beaten, lying in a ditch, half dead, hopeless. I don't want you to think this morning that that's some just, oh, that's some homeless dude, that's some drug addict. No, friend, that individual is you. You were the one that was hopeless. You were the one that was lost. You were the one that the wages of sin had abused you and attacked you and left you with with no hope. That was you. And may we never forget where we were when Jesus found us. May we never forget that you were in desperate need of a Savior. That individual is you. Here comes a priest, and he sees the the hopeless man beat up, bleeding. Oof. Sucks to be that guy. I got to go to church. And then the Levite comes by, a, a, a spiritual individual. The same thing, like, oh gosh, what a shame. Boy, somebody should do something about that. I'm going to church. I think the priest and the Levite represent so many churches and Christians in our world today. Nobody in this room, but maybe some other Christians or other churches down the street probably, right? Who are professionals at casting judgment who are professionals at being critical, who are professionals at telling people how they got into such a mess, but who are powerless to offer any solutions or any hope how to get out of that said mess. Religious people, legalistic people know all about rules and regulations. They can make it so difficult for people to find Jesus, but they know so little about relationship and they have so few legitimate answers to the real world problems that me and you face every single day, friends. That's the religious system. And then here comes this Samaritan. You've got to realize this Samaritan is considered second class in that society. The Samaritan is discriminated against. The Samaritan is looked down upon. And I want you to know that that Samaritan that came and found you beat up, hopeless, left in the ditch, that Samaritan was Jesus. He didn't come the way people wanted him to come. He didn't do all the things people wanted him to do. But when you were lost, when you were hopeless, when nobody else could or nobody else would save you, Jesus found you, friends. Can I hear an amen this morning? Man, I'm telling you, you've got to realize that Jesus, you did not find Jesus, friends. Jesus found you. He picked you up. He put you on his donkey. He cared for you when nobody else would or could. You owe this man, Jesus, your everything. Great, great story, Mark. That's very encouraging. But there's one more character in this story. See, Jesus picked up this broken man, this hurting man. And he carried him to an innkeeper. And he told the innkeeper, 
take care of this individual. This person is valuable. Here, I'm going to give you some of my own resources to make sure that you care for this person, that you feed this person, that you provide for his needs. Love this person. Do everything you can. And I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to reimburse you for anything above and beyond what you've done. The innkeeper in the story, BCC, is us. The innkeeper is the church. I don't know when church became a museum for the righteous, but the church is called to be a hospital for the sick. Jesus is wanting to bring the hurting, the broken, the hopeless, the addict, the desolate, the the people that society and the world has thrown away. He wants to bring those people to you, to the church. Love on these people. Care for these people. Do whatever you got to do to teach them, to train them, to love them, to just treat them like they're valuable and that they're worth something. We can't grow weary in doing good, church, because he's coming back. And when he does come back, he is going to reimburse you, friends, with eternal rewards for anything and everything that you've done for those that are most valuable. You are so loved this morning. And the addict and the homeless and the homosexual and the transgender and all the other non they are so valuable and so loved by Jesus. Jesus is looking for people, looking for a place, looking for an inn, a church that's going to love people, not when it's convenient, not when it's comfortable, not when it's easy, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. He's looking for people that are going to love and love until it hurts. And I believe that the heart of God is He wants to use this place to do that. As I prayed for this morning specifically, I believe that God really gave me a word for you people, a promise for you people. I believe that the Lord spoke to me and He said, if they will provide the love, then He will provide the people and He will provide the resource. But will you provide the love? It starts with each and every one of you. It doesn't start with Pastor Jason, Pastor Jen, Pastor Caleb and Alyssa. It, I mean, they have an enormous role to play. But you're the church. You're the innkeepers You're going to go to a job tomorrow that Pastor Jason's not going to go to. You're going to go to practices. You're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to do things. You can't fold him up and put him in your back pocket and take him with you. He wants to use you to make a difference in the world that you live in today. He wants to use you to love people, to show the heart and the compassion of Jesus to people everywhere in every way. I don't care if you've been saved for three days or for 30 years, you gotta know today, God can use you to do incredible things to make a difference in this world. If this church isn't about making a difference, then what the heck are we doing here this morning? My goodness, I'll I'll go back to bed. Let's go fishing. Let's go. Let's go. I mean, if we're just here to hang out, we can do that anytime. This church is called to make a difference. This church is called to shine light in a dark, dark, hopeless world. But you got to say yes, VCC. You got to say yes. Yes, Jesus. I will be that person. I will show love. I will love when it's inconvenient. I will love when it's uncomfortable. I will love when it costs. I will love when it hurts. The crazy thing about it is is that God doesn't need people that are super qualified, super talented, have loads of experience. They don't have to be humanity's first choice. Like, take all those things off the plate. All God needs from you this morning is your yes. If he has your yes, he can take care of the rest, friends. I promise you.